I'm Richard Barr, Professor of Radiology at Northeastern Ohio University Colleges of Medicine and Radiologist for Radiology Consultants in Youngstown, Ohio. Today I'll be giving you a lecture on how we do breast elastography. Hello, I'm Richard Barr um, from Youngstown, Ohio. Um, I'm going to give you a lecture on ultrasound elasticity uh, in the breast, uh, reviewing our work that we've done in, with this technique. Uh, before we start, I would like to disclose that I am on the advisory boards and have received equipment grants from both Siemens Ultrasound and Philips Ultrasound. Uh, you should also recognize that elastography is a new and rapidly evolving technology and some of the technologies discussed in this talk may not be approved for clinical use in some countries. I advise you to check with your clinical applications person for your manufacturer uh, to determine if the techniques that we're talking about today uh, are available or approved in your country. The objectives uh, for this talk is one to provide a historical background of elasticity imaging, uh, discuss the principles of elasticity imaging without using any equations, explain differences between compression elastography and shear wave elastography, uh, review initial results of elasticity imaging in the breast, and discuss limitations of the technique. What is elasticity imaging? Um, it is an ultrasound image that is based not on the anatomy like B-mode imaging, but actually on the stiffness of tissues. You can consider it as the imaging equivalent of a physical exam. So what we feel with a finger when we do a clinical exam, we're using the ultrasound waves to do uh, with ultrasound and generate a uh, picture of that physical exam. There are two types of elastography that we're going to talk about today. One is compression elastography. With this technique, the stiffness of a tissue is calculated based on the displacement of the tissue with a compressive force. In other words, we're going to apply some pressure uh, on the tissues and we're going to see how they move and use ultrasound to determine how they move uh, to decide if they're hard or soft. This technique is qualitative. Uh, it provides us how stiff or hard something is to the other objects that are in the field of view. Another technique is called shear wave elastography. In this technique, an ultrasound push pulse is applied to tissue, and conventional ultrasound is used to measure the speed of the shear wave that propagates through the tissue. From this speed of sound through the tissue, the strain modulus can be calculated. In this technique, since we know the amount of force that was applied, we can come up with a quantitative measurement of how hard or soft a tissue is. Elasticity imaging of the breast is performed with a conventional ultrasound unit and standard ultrasound breast probes uh, for the displacement uh, elastography. The software analysis of frame-to-frame -frame differences in deformation of the tissue with mild compression allows for the display of stiffness or hardness of a lesion, the strain image. In this slide, you can see the image on the left shows the B-mode image, and here we have a lesion that is isoechoic to the surrounding background, so the lesion is not very conspicuous on B-mode imaging. However, the lesion is very hard compared to the background tissue, and we do displacement elastography. You can see that we can see the lesion much better because it shows up as being hard compared to a soft background. An easy way of explaining what we're doing or what the uh, algorithm is doing in determining the displacement elastography is to consider an almond in a, a bowl of jelly, or jello, excuse me. Um, if we deform the jello with, uh, in this case, a spoon, we change the shape of the jello because it's soft and moves. However, the almond is hard, and no matter how hard we push, we don't change the shape of the almond. So what the ultrasound system does is it looks at the frame-to-frame -frame differences when we're applying the pressure. And if the tissues change shape like the jello in this case, it codes it as being soft. 
if it's hard, like the almond, and does not change shape, the algorithm considers it to be hard and therefore codes it as being hard. Um, Kropsig did uh, some work with uh, tissues uh, for uh, many, many tissue types. Um, and one of the things that he found was for breast lesions and looking at the elasticity properties, the cancerous and non-cancerous lesions had a large difference between them with very little overlap. And the difference uh, was on the factor of 1,000 to 5,000. Uh, based on this uh, basic physics information, uh, we should be able to do very well in distinguishing benign lesions from malignant lesions on uh, elastography of the breast. Unfortunately, this wide difference with very little overlap uh, does not occur uh, as well in other tissues. So although this technique can be applied to many tissues, um, it will probably be best utilized in the breast. Early work in evaluating elasticity imaging the breast was found to have limited use in a clinical setting. Um, however, these techniques used in these studies suffered in that the technique was not real-time and there was suboptimal resolution based on the equipment. Uh, with the recent development of real-time elasticity systems, which have a real-time dual display of both the B-mode image and the elasticity imaging, uh, and significant improved spatial resolution, the technique is now ready for clinical use. The compression elastogram generated displays the relative stiffness to the rest of the image. Therefore, a given tissue will have a different shade of gray in each elastogram, depending on what other tissues are in the field of view. Fat in an entirely fatty breast will appear darker than in a very dense breast uh, because of this um, limitation of the technique. And because of this limitation, it's going to be very difficult to use compression elastography um, as, as it is presently performed as a screening examination. This is an example uh, to show you how tissues can appear in different shades of gray or colors if you're using them based on what's in the field of view. In this first image, uh, we have a fat lobule that's surrounded by dense breast tissue, a little bit of fatty tissue anteriorly, and muscle posteriorly. And as you would predict on the elastogram, which is shown on the image on the right, you can see that the fat shows up as being white, meaning it's much softer than the surrounding tissues. However, in this second case in the bottom, where the, almost the entire image is fat, this area of fat that I've circled in red shows up as being black because it is the stiffest fat within the image. Technique is uh, very important in getting optimal images, and this technique actually changed based on manufacturers. Some manufacturers' equipment requires very little or no compression, while others require some manual compression and release to generate an appropriate elastogram. So one manufacturer's uh, equipment uh, to, may get an optimal image where on another manufacturer's using the same technique, you may not even generate an elastogram. For our system, we select to display hard lesions or less strain as black and soft lesions uh, or more strain as white. Thus, in general, fat is going to be depicted as a white lesion and cancers are going to be depicted as black lesions. We can use color maps. They are available, and there are several maps available. My personal preference is to use black and white for compression elastography because it's a relative technique, and I feel that I can interpret the images better using black and white. When we talk about shear wave imaging, where we get an absolute uh, number uh, which color codes the pixels, um, in that case, color can be very useful uh, in providing a very uh, easy way to interpret the images. Um, this is a case of an invasive ductal carcinoma. I just want to review how the images are displayed um, for your uh, interpretation. On the left side of the image is our standard B-mode image. There is a field of view box, uh, which 
is the field of view that we're going to be used to generate the elastogram. On the image on the right is the elastogram and again we're using hard uh, as black and soft as white. Um, in this system there's also a quality factor uh, that gives us a number that corresponds to um, how well we're in the range of appropriate displacement to generate a adequate image. Um, I will say that there are other factors other than this quality factor to generate a good image which we'll be talking about. So having a high quality factor does not necessarily mean that you're going to have uh, the optimal image. Um, you can see in this uh, case on the B-mode image this is uh, clearly a BIRADS-5 uh, lesion and you can see on the elastogram we can uh, see the lesion quite well. We can see uh, good distinct borders um, and we can see that the lesion appears slightly larger on the elastogram than it does on the B-mode image and we'll discuss uh, that uh, finding uh, shortly. Also want you to note that when we have shadowing from this tumor uh, we don't see that in the elastogram. Um, that artifact does not transpose over uh, into the elastogram. So um, the technique um, that we use, the algorithm within the system requires that the strain changes to remain in plane. In other words, because we're comparing how the lesion changes with uh, displacement, if the lesion moves out of the plane, the image uh, that we uh, use to interpret will therefore see a change that actually didn't occur. It was because the lesion moved in and out of the plane and therefore give us inaccurate uh, elastogram. So uh, it's very important that you monitor the B-mode image as you're doing the elastogram to make sure that the lesion remains in the imaging plane and does not change during the time you're collecting the uh, elastogram. In general, we like to obtain a short clip of the elastogram and then go back and do our appropriate measurements. We do this uh, routinely in all our clinical cases, and I do not like to have the patient wait while we do a lot of measurements. Um, so we tend to do the least amount of measurements while the patient is there to uh, determine what we're going to do with the patient um, and, and move on with that. Um, and then we can come back with the stored image clip and, and do further measurements if we're going to do uh, research and want to get some additional information. Um, in general, what we found is the longer you take uh, doing measurements and looking at the screen, the more anxious the patient gets because they think you see something um, that is concerning um, and it really raises their anxiety. So uh, we really try to do um, the most um, efficient uh, imaging and measurements we can uh, while the patient is there to do the appropriate um, management um, and like I said save clips uh, and for research measurements uh, we do those uh, after the patient has left. The technique we use um, we try to uh, limit the patient uh, motion and the keeping the lesion in the plane by having the uh, probe and the lesion perpendicular to gravity. So we tend to roll the patient so we have the uh, probe, the lesion, and the table all in one straight line. This also helps because for the systems we use we need very, very little motion and we try to set this up so it's the patient's breathing and heartbeat that causes the displacement. And again, we want that to be in line with the lesion and the probe so that the lesion is moving um, up and down in the field of view and not right to left. And uh, with some practice uh, you can acquire this technique uh, very easily. For most patients what we found is to get adequate images uh, we just need to have the patient do normal breathing and between the heartbeat and the breathing that is uh, all the amount of displacement we need to generate a good elastogram. As we said in the beginning of the talk different manufacturers require different amounts of compression. I will say with the systems that we have, the two extremes are patients that have very small breasts, the breathing may actually cause too much displacement and we do not uh, get a good elastogram. In that case, I actually have the patient uh, hold their breath and try to hold the probe as still as possible to get a good elastogram. The 
Other extreme is patients with very large breasts uh, where it's very difficult to have the uh, lesion and the probe aligned and the breast may be hanging off to the side of the patient. And in that case, we do have to apply a, a small amount of uh, rhythmic uh, compression and decompression to generate the elastogram. Um, and it's a technique can be, that can be easily learned uh, but does require uh, some practice. Um, some tips to help you generate uh, the most optimal images are to keep the field of view as large as you can and try to include fat, normal breast tissue, and the lesion. Because we're doing a comparison of different tissues, this allows you to compare the elasticity properties of the lesion to both fat and normal tissue. If the lesion is a cancer, it will be much harder than both fat and normal tissue and show up black with fat and normal tissue showing up as white or light gray. If the lesion is benign, it will have similar elasticity characteristics to the normal breast tissue and will be slightly um, darker than the fat, but will be uh, approximately the same uh, shade of gray as the normal breast tissue. Um, we really like to look at the B-mode image when we're doing these, uh, and again, it's to help you get an idea of the amount of displacement of tissues that you're getting. Um, and with practice, you'll learn what the appropriate amount of displacement is. And also looking at the B-mode image just helps you stay uh, so that the lesion remains in the same plane. Uh, one of the things when we started elasticity imaging, we were concerned, uh, does it matter where on the lesion you do this examination? Uh, and this is a case of a invasive ductal cancer. Um, and what we did is scan the lesion in multiple different uh, planes and in multiple directions. And we get the same results no matter where we are scanning. Uh, I mentioned earlier that um, in the cancer we showed before that the cancers tend to show up larger on the elastogram than they do on the B-mode image. And we have seen cancers that have been three, almost four times as large on the elastogram as they have been on the B-mode image. And it's important that you recognize this because if you have a lesion that is two centimeters and it gets uh, three times larger, it's now six centimeters in size and completely envelops the field of view of the elastogram and you will not be able to see the borders of the lesion um, and therefore not be able to get accurate measurements uh, and may be confused as to know, even know where the lesion is. So what we try to do is pick a position in the larger lesions so that the lesion that we're doing the elastogram on is about one to one and a half centimeters in size, and this allows us to make sure that on the elastogram we can see the borders of the lesion. There are several different measurements you can use to determine uh, the size changes in lesions. Um, and again, we've talked about that uh, breast cancers appear larger uh, on the uh, elastogram, and actually benign lesions appear smaller. And each manufacturer has uh, their own way of you getting measurements. Um, what you can do is uh, we usually measure the lesion on the B-mode image, and then we use what's called the shadow function, which draws the same line in the same position on the elastogram. You can then change the measurement size uh, in that position to match the elastogram, and the system will provide you with a ratio of the uh, elastogram to the B-mode image. Um, you can use area measurements uh, or um, volume measurements. They will all work. We tend to use the length measurement um, because it is the easiest for us to do uh, when the patient is there. And again, we use this clinically, uh, so we really would like to uh, determine what the uh, treatment we're going to offer the patient is so we can tell them that while they're on the table. This is a video clip of a mucinous cancer uh, on the B-mode image. Um, you can see the lesion is somewhat isodense to the surrounding tissue uh, with some hypoechoic areas within it. But on the elastogram, you can see the borders of the lesion quite well. 
um, you can also see that during this video clip that we can see the margins of the lesion on the elastogram throughout the cycle. And this is important because if you are not getting this quality of images, uh, you're having some problems with your technique and you need to uh, talk to your applications person to uh, make sure you're getting adequate technique. Um, what we found in uh, mucinous cancers is that the ratio is um, one or slightly larger in these lesions, so it, we don't see the changes that we see uh, with invasive ductal cancers. One thing that we found is probably the most important factor in acquiring optimal elastograms is something called pre-compression. The elastogram image that you generate is significantly affected by the amount of pre-compression or how much pressure you, you use when you're obtaining the image. As you apply additional pressure, pushing the probe onto the breast, um, the tissues beneath the probe become stiffer and therefore give you different results. In this video clip, um, I'm going to try to explain this uh, technique to you. Um, I'll start the clip again shortly, but here we have on the left our B-mode image, and what I want you to notice is um, this rib, um, as well as a lesion that's sitting right here, uh, which is an epidermoid cyst. Um, for the first time I start this clip, I want you to just look at the B-mode image. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start the clip with a lot of compression, uh, probably more than anyone uses uh, in uh, generating their B-mode images. And as we go through that clip, I'm going to be releasing pressure. And I want you to just to look at this rib. So we started here, and you can see as I'm pulling back on the probe and lifting up, we're getting less and less pre-compression. Now I'm going to start the clip again, and this time let's look at the elastogram. You can see when we start in, I have a lot of pre-compression. We don't see the lesion at all. As we get to the middle, we can see the lesion occasionally, but not throughout the whole clip. And at the end, we can see the lesion quite well. And I just pulled out uh, three areas from those clips so we can uh, discuss them a little bit better um, and look at them. So again, we have significant pre-compression, mild pre-compression, which is actually where I consider I do my standard B-mode imaging, uh, because I think we need a little bit of pre-compression to actually get optimal B-mode images and very minimal pre-compression where I do my imaging for the elastogram. And again, you can see with compression, you can see this uh, epidermoid cyst better with uh, compression um, because it lays out the tissues better. It also uh, changes the Cooper's ligament so we have less artifacts. So again, when we're doing B-mode imaging, we actually like to use this pre-compression. But you can see here I have the rib at approximately 1.2 centimeters, and our elastogram is basically all noise. Um, as we move to mild compression, you can see the rib is now dropped to about 1.7 centimeters. Um, we can still see the uh, lesion fairly well. And you can see on the elastogram, uh, we don't see uh, a really good elastogram. As we go through a clip, it'll appear well on some frames, and poorly on others. As we go to very minimal compression, you can see that the rib has dropped to almost two centimeters in depth. The lesion doesn't show up quite as well on the B-mode image because we're using less compression, but we get a really excellent elastogram. So my recommendation is initially when you're doing your work, you'll do your standard B-mode imaging using your amount of pre-compression which uh, you feel you generate the optimal images. And after you've done your standard exam with B-mode imaging and color, then uh, you can move on to the elastogram. Um, you should also realize that when you're doing uh, color imaging, you will get much better color Doppler imaging if you use uh, this minimal amount of pre-compression. Also, because as you apply compression, you occlude vessels um, and you uh, also then for uh, decrease the amount of color flow Doppler you're going to see. Um, and just to show you uh, that I didn't make this up, this is the same patient, uh, and I'm doing this clip again, and I'm just applying, here again, we got this rib at two centimeters. So you can see I'm doing the same lesion 
with very minimal pre-compression. And you can see throughout the whole clip, we can see the uh, lesion on the elastogram very well. So my recommendation is when you do your B-mode image, when you're done and you want to do your elastogram, choose something in the image and just slowly lift up on your probe. And as you do that, you will see what you're looking at drop deeper and deeper into the field of view. And what you want to do is make that fall as far down in the field of view as you can and still get a uh, image. Um, that will allow you to apply the appropriate amount of pre-compression and get reproducible, excellent uh, elastograms. Uh, we talked about the size measurements, and I just want to go over um, the literature regarding that. Uh, Tim Hall in 2001 uh, was the first to recognize that there was a size change with cancers, um, and he used a EI, or elastogram measurement, to the B-mode image. Uh, he used area, and he came up with a ratio of 1.2. Um, had So if the elastogram image uh, was 1.2 or larger than the B-mode area, that they had a 100% sensitivity of this predicting a malignancy and had a specificity of 75%. Um, we did a initial pilot study uh, with the system um, where uh, we used the technique that I've described, and we chose to use a ratio, a length ratio of 1.0. So if a lesion on the elastogram was uh, the same as or greater than on the B-mode image, we called it a malignancy. If it was less than one, we called it benign. And in that study that uh, we presented at the RSNA in 2006 and has uh, recently been published in Ultrasound Quarterly, um, we looked at 123 patients who were coming to us uh, for an ultrasound-guided biopsy. Um, all the patients had core biopsies and pathology. Of the 123 patients uh, that we biopsied, 106 of those were benign and 17 were malignant. When we looked at the elastogram of the 106 pathologically benign lesions, 105 of them had a elastogram to B-mode ratio uh, of less than one, giving us a specificity of 99%. All 17 malignancies um, had a elastogram to B-mode ratio of greater than one, giving us a sensitivity of 100%. Um, so these were uh, very uh, excellent uh, results, and we wanted to see if these were reproducible in other labs. We therefore did a, a multi-center, uh, multinational trial uh, where we enrolled 635 patients, all of which were female with an average age of 56. And again, it was the same uh, study. All these patients were being referred for an ultrasound-guided biopsy, they had their standard ultrasound examination. They had an elastogram performed. Uh, the site investigator uh, determined the EI to BI ratio. Um, and then we got the pathology uh, from uh, core biopsies or uh, FNA. Of the 635 patients, 65% or 413 were benign lesions. 35% or 222 were malignant lesions. And as these were basically all comers to all the labs in the study, we had a uh, really good distribution of pathology and a standard distribution of pathology uh, that one would see in a, a standard breast care clinic. Um, the results are for each of the six sites, the number of lesions that were biopsied, how many of those lesions were benign, of the benign lesions, how many had a, a EI to B mode length ratio of less than one? How many um, pathology were malignant? And of those malignant lesions, how many had a, a EI to B mode ratio of equal to or greater than one? Um, and you can see if we look at the specificity, that is how many of the benign lesions on pathology had a ratio of less than one, the uh, ranges uh, were varied between 67% and 97%, uh, with an average uh, specificity of 87%, uh, which is uh, actually uh, very excellent. 
Um, if we look at the malignant lesions, um, all centers except one had 100% uh, sensitivity. The one center that actually um, uh, did not have 100% had 97% of their 90 malignancies. Three of those uh, had a ratio of less than one. So that gives us an overall sensitivity of 98.6%. Um, after the study was done uh, and the cases were reviewed, the three lesions that uh, appeared smaller on the elastogram uh, was a case of invasive ductal cancer, a lobular cancer, and a mucinous cancer. And in retrospect, um, it is probably that the measurements on the B-mode image were probably inaccurate. And again, I think one of the key points you need to uh, use is you cannot use this length change measurement if you do not see the lesion very well on both the B-mode image as well as the elastogram. Um, and we presented these results at the RSNA uh, in 2007. And from that study, uh, these were our results. Now for the benign lesions, the EI to B-mode ratio went from 0.2 to 1.5, an average 0.76. The malignant lesions went from 0.9 to 3.1. And again, if we remove those three cases that were probably measured incorrectly, that ratio would have gone from 1.0 to 3.1. Um, these results were extremely significant. Uh, and uh, you can see from the scatter plot that we, uh, with the ratio of 1, I actually do get a very good separation of the benign and malignant lesions. Another interesting observation that uh, our lab made uh, during our initial studies uh, with this was that both simple cysts and complicated cysts had a very characteristic elastogram. Um, they both had what I call a bullseye appearance, um, which is a white spot in a uh, black lesion and a posterior white spot. Um, we also noted that four lesions that on B mode we thought were solid and referred for uh, biopsy also had this bullseye appearance. And on biopsy, all of these supposedly solid lesions turned out to be complicated cysts. Um, here's an example of this, uh, which we know is now a uh, artifact, um, a simple cyst on the B mode image. And again, you can see the lesion shows up as a black ring with a white central area and a white area posterior to the lesion. Um, we wanted to determine uh, if this lesion uh, could be used clinically and it had a high sensitivity and specificity uh, for evaluation of cystic lesions. So we looked at 127 uh, consecutive patients who appeared in our lab that had this uh, bullseye artifact. And the sizes range from two millimeters to 40 millimeters with a mean of nine millimeters. Of these 127 lesions, 62 or approximately half were biopsied and pathologically confirmed as simple or benign complicated cysts. The other half or 65 of the lesions were simple cysts based on B-mode criteria and therefore were not biopsied. If we look at the uh, 62 lesions that uh, were biopsied that did not meet the criteria for being a simple cyst on B-mode image, 56 or 90% of them uh, we knew on the B-mode image uh, were most likely complicated cysts. And actually 6 or 10% of those had an appearance which we thought uh, the lesion was solid on B-mode imaging. Um, I just wanted to show you um, an another set of slides. Um, if you're using different systems, you need to check with your manufacturer uh, to make sure that this artifact does occur on their systems. Um, and I'm showing you here images from a Philips system, uh, which has multiple uh, settings for elasticity imaging. If you use their setting number two, you get the bullseye appearance as we've talked about, the white central dot, the black lesion, and the white peripheral zone. If you use their elasticity setting number one, you see the lesion is black, 
you do not see the central white spot, but you do see the peripheral white zone. They also have uh, another setting called AI or anechoic imaging uh, in which the uh, cystic contents would show up as uh, yellow on a black background. I do want to mention that there are other scales uh, used to grade images, um, and I'd like to mention the Hitachi score. Um, they use a uh, score system that is uh, more set to uh, kind of a BIRAD score, which goes from 1 to 5. Um, and if you look, uh, let's start at uh, 5. Um, their score 5 is a lesion that appears larger than the B-mode image and is harder. Their image number 4, the lesion is harder but is the same size as the lesion. So again, their uh, score 4 and 5 corresponds to our saying that a lesion is equal to or greater than 1 and therefore uh, is suspicious and needs further work. Um, their uh, BIRAD scores 1, 2, and 3, um, the lesion is uh, either soft uh, or mottled, and uh, for their BIRAD 3, the lesion may be hard, but it actually gets smaller, corresponding to our uh, less than, uh, ratio of less than 1, and therefore probably benign. Um, and they see an artifact in their cysts, uh, which they have this uh, tricolored a blue, green, red on their uh, color-coded uh, elastogram. Because compression elastography is qualitative and not quantitative, investigators have looked at uh, a way of trying to make this semi-quantitative. And one way you can do that is to compare the ratio of the uh, lesions um, to fat. So uh, you can on the system, uh, depending on which country you're in, uh, draw a region of interest in the lesion and a region of interest in fat. And you can compare the um, stiffness of those two lesions and therefore obtain a ratio of how hard the lesion is compared to fat. Um, there was a nice study presented at RSNA in 2008 uh, that looked at this and they found that a ratio of less than 4.8 uh, corresponded to a benign lesion and a ratio of 4.8 or larger corresponded to a malignant lesion. Um, Pre-compression is critical uh, in determining these measurements and the amount of pre-compression uh, needs to be minimal and needs to be the same when you do this measurement. Um, therefore, the uh, areas that you use for the field of view should be uh, at the same field of depth. If, I'm sorry, field of depth if possible uh, to give you the most accurate measurements. Um, let me just review how I use EI imaging in our uh, breast care clinic. Um, the most obvious is: can we determine if a lesion is benign or malignant, which we've talked about before, and we can use again a length or area measurement. Uh, we can use this relative stiffness to fat, or you can use a color scale uh, like the Hitachi to determine if something is benign or malignant. But in addition to that, we can look at the elastogram and, and use information if the lesion is hard or soft to provide us some diagnostic information, such as, is the lesion really a fat lobule? Is the lesion uh, iso an isoechoic area on the B-mode image? Um, and there actually is a lesion present. Um, is the, a lesion that's isoechoic on the B-mode image really a complicated cyst? Can we use the elastogram to help us better define where to do a biopsy? And is there some characteristic information uh, within the elastogram uh, that may tell us uh, some histopathology uh, regarding the lesion? So this first example I, I showed you before. This is a patient that was referred to us uh, because this hypoechoic uh, lobular mass in this dense breast tissue was referred to us for an ultrasound-guided biopsy. Uh, when we did the elastogram, you could see that this is an extremely soft lesion and is uh, iso-hard or the similar hardness to other fat in the lesion, and this is actually just a fat lobule uh, and does not need to have a biopsy. 
This is a, a lipoma. And again, this is an example that this is a qualitative technique, not a quantitative technique. Um, although the lesion is here and uh, is different than we see in the background fat, um, on the elastogram, it shows up as being the same intensity as the fat. Um, but it does have this white ring around it. Um, and this actually white ring is a artifact. Um, and I can say this because I did the images. These uh, were not properly obtained images because this lesion was moving in and out of the field of view uh, when we were doing the examination. And this uh, ring artifact is because the lesion was moving in and out of plane um, and therefore um, this artifact actually can be used to help us determine benign lesions as malignant lesions are fixed to the adjacent structures um, and do not move independently from the adjacent tissues. In this case this lipoma is encapsulated and is, as we compress the uh, lipoma is moving in and out of the plane um, differently than the adjacent tissues are and that would pro what provides us this uh, ring artifact. Um, this poor woman um, had gone to two other centers before she came to us. She presented, she had a clearly palpable mass that everyone could feel. Her mammogram was negative. She had two other ultrasounds, they were negative. Um, we did an ultrasound, this is the B-mode image. Um, and without the elastogram, I also would have been, um, call this a negative exam. Um, we knew where the lesion was because it was clearly palpable. When we do the elastogram, you can see that we clearly get the bullseye cyst artifact. Um, we aspirated this uh, lesion. It completely disappeared. The palpable mass went away. There was no residual uh, tissue left on the B-mode image. And on pathology, this was just a complicated cyst. Um, I've mentioned this before, but I think it's uh, another interesting thing. Um, that can help you uh, when you're trying to decide where to do a biopsy. Um, in a lot of these uh, larger, harder cancers, we do get a lot of shadowing on the B-mode image, and it's very difficult to determine exactly uh, where the posterior border of the malignancy is. Um, the shadowing artifact does not occur on the elastogram, so you can uh, clearly define the posterior margin of the uh, tumor. Um, We've talked about the cancers appearing uh, larger than on the B-mode image. Um, it's unclear to me if the elastogram actually is a better predictor of the size of the lesion versus the B-mode image. Uh, there is some work going on to determine um, if that is the case. Um, and again, this size change uh, may predict uh, some features of the cancer uh, in regards to its aggressiveness. Um, this is an interesting case. Um, this patient had a lesion on mammography that was clearly visible. Um, if possible, we try to do all our biopsies under ultrasound. So we brought the patient to ultrasound. Um, this was the lesion. Um, and again, without having the mammogramming, knowing where the lesion was, it would be very difficult just based on the B-mode image for us to be confident that this was the lesion. Um, but I do want to show you a couple features of this lesion. One is in red I've circled what I'm going to call a head to the lesion and with the green arrow I'm pointing to a little tail from the lesion. So when we do our elastogram you can see the lesion now is much harder than the surrounding tissues and um, we can see the tail much better. The problem is when we look at the head of the lesion, the head of the lesion is very soft and blends in with the surrounding tissues. Um, so this was very puzzling to us. We did the biopsy of this lesion. Um, it was an invasive ductal carcinoma. She had a, a lumpectomy. Um, and after that lumpectomy, we went to the pathologist and said, could you review this with us? Because uh, we couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and it turns out that this uh, head that we have circled in red was actually a benign fibroadenoma that was attached to or adjacent to the invasive ductal cancer. So the elastogram actually was correct. 
um, this head was actually a benign fibroadenoma and just blended in with the normal background. Um, so again, um, you can use the elastogram to help you to decide where to biopsy because if we had just biopsied this area, then we would have come back that the lesion was a benign fibroadenoma and made an inaccurate diagnosis. Um, I will say that I did have another case uh, where we had a 6 millimeter um, malignancy that was adjacent to a 6 millimeter fibroadenoma. And on the B mode image, the ultrasound acoustical properties of the two were very similar, and they appeared as one lesion. Um, when we did the elastogram, we kept getting conflicting results as the lesion got larger or it got smaller. Um, and again, we were very confused. We uh, did a biopsy of the patient. It came back malignant. The patient went to surgery. We looked at the specimen and to find out that, again, it was uh, basically two lesions, not one, that were very similar in size, one a benign fibroadenoma, uh, the other an invasive ductal cancer. So uh, you need to keep this in mind, and when you are having problems at your elastogram, keep this in mind that on the B-mode image, Maybe there's not one lesion, but two lesions, um, and the B-mode image is providing you some information uh, to determine that. Uh, I just wanted to show you a benign fibroadenoma. Um, this is kind of a taller than wider uh, lobular mass on the B-mode image, uh, so a BIRADS4 lesion. You can see it clearly gets smaller on the elastogram. And uh, here again, we have some, these are uh, very old images. We do again get this artifact, uh, a ring artifact around the lesion, secondary to the lesion moving in and out of plane uh, when we acquire the images. Um, this patient um, had a mammogram, screening mammogram. We noticed a, uh, a lesion that was suspicious. We brought it ultrasound. This is the B-mode ultrasound. And again, uh, an isochoic lesion to the background uh, fat, but we knew where the lesion was on the mammogram, and it had uh, same size and configuration. So we were very confident that this was the lesion that we were seeing on the mammogram. Um, and again, very solid appearance, looked a speculated. Uh, we felt that this was uh, a BIRADS 4C or even a BIRADS 5 lesion. Um, and you can see when we did the elastogram, we got the bullseye appearance. Um, we did an FNA. We're able to aspirate the lesion. Um, it disappeared on uh, the B-mode image. Um, this was early in our experience, so we went ahead and actually did a core biopsy uh, to completely uh, remove that area uh, to make sure we were not missing anything. And on pathology, this came back to be a complicated cyst. And again, the core biopsy showed the uh, cyst wall uh, within it. So uh, there was no question that this was a benign complicated cyst appearing as a suspicious solid mass. And I think this is important because our pathology department, if we uh, send this specimen to them and say that we are concerned about a um, solid mass and they do not see a reason on the pathology to explain a solid mass, they tend to put a statement in that further work is required, the lesion needs to be re-biopsied uh, or surgically excised. Um, and this puts us in a predicament. Um, if we go back to look at the ultrasound, and this was a complicated cyst, it's now no longer present, um, and you have the dilemma of what do you do with this patient? Do you send them uh, for surgery to remove uh, a larger... Uh, specimen from that area, do you follow them closely? So again, knowing that this was not a solid mass but a complicated cyst and passing that information to the pathologist uh, leads to uh, less confusion and um, better um, correlation between the radiology and pathology. Um, this was a, an elderly lady that came in with a bloody discharge. Um, she had a large mass on mammography on ultrasound, we can see a kind of a bilobed lesion that's very complex with some cystic areas and some solid areas. Um, we did the elastogram, and you can see that the right side of the bilobed lesion was very soft, um, but it did not have the cyst artifact. 
um, the um, left side of the lesion uh, got larger and was very hard. Um, there was an air, excuse me, a fluid fluid level on this uh, right side on the B-mode image, so we were uh, considering that since the patient had a bloody discharge that maybe this was uh, blood components, um, so what we did is we went in and aspirated this side uh, with a 20 gauge needle and it was all uh, old thick blood. Uh, we then went in and cored uh, the solid portion of this lesion um, and this was an invasive papillary uh, malignancy. And again, helpful information from the uh, elastogram showing you that this portion was probably benign um, and very soft and in this case blood. And this is the area that was hard and suspicious uh, to guide our biopsy. Um, we were very concerned because when we look at this bullseye artifact, although we did this study, we really did not have any uh, cystic carcinomas. And we were concerned, would this artifact uh, hide uh, a cystic neoplasm? Um, and what we've seen, this case is actually the smallest solid component within a cyst um, that I've seen so far. And this is courtesy of Carmel Smith uh, from Australia. Um, you can see that there's a two millimeter introductal benign papilloma in this cystic lesion. And you can see that the solid component, the papilloma, appears smaller on the elastogram. And you can clearly see that solid component in the cyst artifact. Um, and we have seen many, many other lesions uh, since then, and we feel very confident that uh, if there is a solid component in the cyst, it will show up um, as being a hard area within the bullseye artifact. Uh, another more recent example where we have a solid component uh, in the cystic lesion, um, and you can see we've got the bullseye artifact, and um, here you can see that there's a solid component here uh, which um, is harder but smaller. This was a benign uh, lesion. But again, we feel very confident. Another thing I'll show you is there's a clearly another cyst artifact here corresponding to something in the B-mode image here, um, which is isodense. And what we have found is there are many isodense cysts uh, within the breast that we really don't see very well on B-mode imaging. So uh, if you see this artifact and there's no corresponding B-mode image, we believe that there probably is a uh, cyst there, but it's probably benign and is a not of clinical uh, significance. An interesting case, we also decided to look at lymph nodes. Uh, we routinely look at lymph nodes in patients uh, that uh, we think have uh, cancers. Um, to do uh, staging at our initial biopsy. Um, this patient had a um, somewhat normal appearing uh, lymph node other than being somewhat large uh, in her uh, level two area on ultrasound. When we did the elastogram, we saw this area in the upper pole, if you will, of the lymph node that persistently was much harder uh, and um, kind of deformed where the lymph node was. Um, and again, I apologize, these were some of the very first images we have uh, from probably about 10 years ago, so the image quality is not as good as now, but we were able to, uh, you can keep elasticity imaging on. We used um, a core needle and guided it with elasticity imaging to biopsy this area, and this was a foci of um, malignancy uh, within the lymph node. Um, another interesting case, again, the patient uh, came in, had her screening mammogram. There was a lesion we were concerned about. She came for a diagnostic ultrasound, and we found this um, hypoechoic mass that had irregular borders, uh, what appear to be speculations, as well as shadowing. Um, when we do the elastogram, we got a bullseye artifact. So uh, we stuck a... Um, 20 gauge needle into this lesion, completely aspirated it, uh, the lesion disappeared, and again, this was early in our experience, we were very concerned because this uh, was uh, very suspicious on the uh, B-mode imaging. We went back and did core biopsies through this area, 
and again obtained um, pathology findings of a complicated cyst uh, with the cyst wall in the core specimen and no other pathology. So um, we think that this bullseye artifact is very, very helpful. Um, and uh, when we see it, even if the lesion appears to be solid, uh, we try to aspirate the lesion first, thinking that it's going to be a cyst. Um, when we went back through our multicenter trial, we tried to figure out why the specificity uh, varied uh, between sites uh, and also uh, why it was about 85% um, and where were our mistakes. Um, what we found was that when you have a hypoechoic lesion such as fibrocystic change or a fibroadenoma that's sitting in an area of dense breast tissue like we have here on the B-mode image. So in red, I've focused in on the fibrocystic change, which is hypoechoic, and in the green, we've got an area of more dense breast tissue. Um, the elasticity properties of the fibrocystic change or fibroadenoma are very similar to the normal dense breast tissue. So when we do the elastogram, it's very difficult for us to distinguish the interfaces between the benign tissue and the uh, fibrocystic change. Um, so this was actually one of my mistakes in the multicenter trial because I interpreted this, what was fibrocystic change, to increase to the whole size of this green area. Um, we biopsied it and again it came back fibrocystic change. Now looking backwards, this area here, these borders here, you can see kind of correspond to the shape of the fibrocystic area and actually that area got smaller, but it, it is very difficult to interpret because the surrounding uh, areas are also the same. And just as I showed you in one of the first slides, that on a B-mode image, we may have isodense, a lesion may be isodense to the background, and we have a very hard time seeing it with um, B-mode imaging, and it can be really clearly seen on elasticity imaging. The reverse is also true. So uh, in especially benign diseases of the breast where the lesion is in dense breast tissue, it is sometimes very hard to interpret these images. Um, other areas that we found out, again, we've had um, several lesions now where when we do the elastogram, which we didn't realize initially, here we're seeing that this on the B-mode image is one lesion and you can clearly see that there is a cyst attached to the lesion on the elastogram. And again, here you have a, a similar case. Uh, so we've seen this not infrequently. Um, you end up with a conundrum of where do you take your measurements. So you just need to be aware of this, um, and if you're concerned, you should always err on the side uh, of doing a biopsy. Um, I do want to mention shear wave elasticity, or a shear wave elastography. Um, and again, this is a quantitative measurement. This is where we put a ultrasound push pulse and we generate a shear wave through the tissue. In a sense, it's the same as when we throw a pebble into a pond and we generate the waves coming out from where the stone goes in. And we can measure those waves and as they go through the tissue, we can determine how hard or soft something is. Um, this is less operator dependent because we do not have to worry about displacing the tissue by uh, using compression, um, but again, pre-compression does play some role in, in affecting this, so you also need to be aware of that, and if you're using this technique, we also advise that you do the same thing and um, make sure that you're applying very little pre-compression when you uh, acquire the image. And again, here um, we like to display these in color because we have an absolute measure and, and the color uh, really does signify some information. Um, let me just show you some examples. Um, here you have a obvious malignancy uh, on the B-mode image, and you can see on the shear wave elastogram, and we're plotting here, blue is soft, red is hard, and we actually have numerical measurements. Uh, this manufacturer likes to use kilopascals as the measurement of how stiff things are. And um, here you can see that the maximum is uh, actually well above 200 kilopascals. Um, and um, 
that signifies that it's extremely hard in, in a cancer. Um, it has some characteristic changes where the center is a little bit softer, but still have a very high measurement of approximately 70 kilopascals. Um, you can contrast that to this image where we have uh, an isoechoic uh, lesion, which on the uh, shear wave elastogram is blue and has a mean value of 25 kilopascals, uh, meaning it's very soft uh, and is benign. In this case, uh, was a fibroadenoma. Um, can this technique be used in other tissues? Yes, um, it can be used anywhere. There's nothing specific about this technique. But again, specifically in compression elastography, we need to have the appropriate amount of displacement. And in shear wave technology, we have to be able to put, push the pulse, I'm sorry, put a push pulse at the appropriate level to generate a shear wave. Um, and these vary between tissues and tissues. Um, in our experience, breast is probably the easiest uh, to do this. Um, but it can be used in other tissues. Um, we get superb images in the thyroid exam. Um, unfortunately, I have not uh, found it to be clinically useful in terms of uh, when or when not to do a biopsy at this point. Uh, further work is going on, uh, but there are some benign thyroid lesions which are very hard. And again, we may have overlap of tissue, and although it does provide us some information, it will not be as sensitive or specific as we see in breast. A lot of work is going on with prostate. Uh, hopefully this technique uh, would allow us to do much better in uh, imaging prostate cancer than what we presently have. Um, and again, it's, it's too early to speculate if, if that is going to be the case. Um, I showed you an example of lymph nodes. Um, it does work in lymph nodes, and it actually can help you find foci of abnormalities within the lymph nodes. Um, so there it, it is, uh, I think, very useful. And uh, again, we use this in all our breast cases where we are looking at lymph nodes to determine um, if we can stage the pa pa patient um, by doing a lymph node biopsy at the time of doing the uh, regular biopsy. Work is being done to see if we can determine uh, the uh, efficacy of a radiofrequency ablation because as we ablate the tissues we change their elasticity properties. Um, my own um, feeling about this is that um, we are looking at relatively uh, large areas of tissue with the elasticity and I don't think that the technique is going to be sensitive enough uh, to completely exclude leaving a small amount of tissue um, that is viable. Uh, we find that uh, ultrasound contrast uh, probably is uh, going to be the method of choice uh, in that uh, field for some time. Um, another very, very uh, useful application is in liver fibrosis. Um, we can, using the quantitative measurements uh, of shear wave, uh, to actually determine a stiffness number for the liver. Um, and work is being uh, presently going on that we can correlate that with pathology. So we can determine the liver stiffness to give us an idea of where on the scale um, of cirrhosis uh, or fatty liver change uh, we can have. And this is a non-invasive test. And we can follow these patients in the, in the same area in the liver over time. Um, I think this is going to be an excellent application. Our initial work with focal liver lesions, however, um, has not been as rewarding, um, and we've had some problems. And again, I think there is a large overlap between the properties um, of benign and malignant lesions on um, their uh, elasticity. Um, so although that we get some information, um, it's not going to be as useful as we find in breast. So at this time, I would like to conclude, um, and I think key things to walk away from this is that each manufacturer has a different algorithm that they're using to generate their displacement elasticity images, and you need to really work with that manufacturer to get the optimal technique. It's important that when you're doing the elastogram, you get very stable images that are reproducible. If you are not, you have a problem with your technique, and you should work with your applications person to um, improve your technique. 
Um, we've shown that our, our initial results are reproducible at multiple sites. Um, we believe that the sensitivity and specificity of compression elastography are greater than 98% sensitivity and approximately um, in the mid 80% specificity just based on size measurements alone. Um, I think that since we've done these studies, we've learned more and are making less mistakes and that our sensi uh, excuse me, our specificity um, is now probably in the uh, low 90s. This technique actually only adds a few minutes to the study, can be interpreted immediately and guide you into uh, what you're going to tell the patient. Um, in our situation, we buy up to the patient while they're there. And again, this uh, really speeds up um, our treatment of the patient. Um, we feel that the technique uh, really has the potential to eliminate a large number of biopsies, and it's better to say probably that this technique allows us to select which lesions really need to be biopsied. I think we can eliminate a lot of the biopsies we're doing on benign lesions presently with this technique. Um, I think that the combination of compression elastography and shear wave technology are going to complement each other um, and actually improve the already very high sensitivities and specificities of this technique in breast. Um, I obviously don't recommend that you stop doing biopsies as soon as you get your elasticity imaging uh, system. Uh, you really need to uh, monitor your work and make sure you're getting accurate results before you stop uh, doing biopsies. Um, and again, the bullseye appearance, I think, is uh, very helpful in determining something is a benign, simple, or complicated cyst. Uh, we find it very helpful uh, in helping us determine uh, how to do a biopsy, an FNA versus a core, uh, or just to um, follow the patient. Key things, if you're going to use the size criteria, you need to see the lesion well in both B mode and elasticity imaging. If you do not, then you really should not use this technique. You can use as the lesion hard or soft compared to other tissues to help guide you um, and the additional information we've talked about. Um, screening is not yet possible, um, but there is no uh, reason why if we can improve these techniques to be um, 3D, especially with shear wave where we get an absolute measurement, that we could use these techniques in doing screening um, and I think that is going to come, but uh, will require um, some time to get to that point. Remember that elasticity imaging is really in its infancy. It's going to continue to grow and evolve and uh, improve. Um, there's no question that I think it's going to play a significant role in breast imaging and will eventually be added to the BIRAD scoring system. Um, work in other organs is going on, but again, just based on the um, information we have on other organs uh, in vitro, um, it's unlikely that we're going to get as good of results we see in breast, um, but this technique will provide us some additional information that in some cases uh, will be very helpful in uh, diagnosis of uh, patients. Um, I kind of look at it in other organs. It's going to be like color Doppler. Sometimes it helps and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, thank you for your time.